Howdy folks, welcome to another installment of Dr. Eigenstate Explains. This video we're going to be shifting gears a little bit. I did a few videos on quantum mechanics and I'm, I'm, I have more coming and I'm sure that there's, there's probably some other topics that people might be interested in hearing. By the way, anybody that watches these videos, if you have any ideas, any things that, that you would like me to explain that maybe you don't understand very well, feel free to leave a comment um, providing suggestions for, for different topics that I can do. Today's video probably going to be another one that's pretty short. We don't have anything too complicated here, but I did want to introduce this concept because we're going to be, in the next set of videos, we're going to be talking a lot about cosmology. And in this video, we're going to start, we're going to start uh, this, we're going to start the new topic of things that I'm talking about in cosmology with galactic redshift. You'll probably notice that the background has changed a little bit. I'm in a different app just simply because in this one you'll, you'll notice that it's not pressure sensitive so I don't have to worry about that anymore because that was something that was irritating me and I'm quite certain was probably irritating a lot of you guys. It made some things hard to read so I wanted to try something new where I didn't have to deal with the pressure sensitivity on my Apple Pencil because I can't shut that off which I don't know if in the second generation pen you can or pencil if you can shut it off, but if not, that's something that Apple needs to work on, which they never will. Um, anyway, we're going to be talking about galactic redshift. Most people already have an idea of what galactic redshift is, but I, I do think that it is something that is worth going over, especially with some of the some of the aspects of cosmology that we're going to be just talking about, that we're going to be discussing in some of these upcoming videos. Galactic redshift was was first observed by, well, before I say that, I do want to say that the universe either expanding or contracting, it not being static, would be a better way of wording that, was predicted by Einstein's general theory of relativity. I believe it predicted a contracting universe because the, the curvature in space-time, the gravity of everything in the universe would have been pulling space-time together, so there would have been a contracting universe. This is why Albert Einstein introduced what he called his cosmological constant, his fudge factor into his equations, that kept space-time static. Because it was, at the time, the, the consensus of astrophysicists and cosmologists that the universe was static. We didn't have any real reasons to think that the universe was either expanding or contracting. Einstein's general theory of relativity was the first thing that it didn't really throw a wrench in that idea. I mean, it did, but then again, it didn't because Einstein corrected for it with the cosmological constant. But it was in 1929, and that's a very poor nine that I just drew there. Don't mind that. That somebody whose name we may all be familiar with, especially the last name, in 1929, Edwin Hubble was making observations of very, very distant galaxies. And one thing that he noted about these, these very distant galaxies, and he, he only noted this with very distant galaxies, not, not, not any galaxies that are close to us, like, you know, say the Andromeda galaxy. It was very, very distant galaxies. He noted that very distant galaxies appear red. And more than that, the, the further away they were, the redder they appeared. So you had some galaxy that was some distance, it's very far from us, and it appeared in the night sky, it's red. But you got one that was further away, and it appeared more red. And the further away that he looked out, the redder these galaxies got. And it was interesting, because there seemed to only be one thing that could explain this. The redness of a galaxy is directly proportional to its distance from us. Well, the first thing is, why are, these why are these galaxies appearing red? Everybody is, at least I hope, familiar with something called the Doppler effect. We've all probably heard it, where when an object that is emitting sound is coming toward you, since it's moving toward you, it's sort of squishing the sound waves, so that pushes them into a higher frequency, and the sound will appear higher pitched as it's coming toward you. And as it's moving away from you, it's stretching the sound wave, so to speak, and it's reducing their frequency, and thus it will have appear to have a lower pitch. 
Well, the same thing can happen with light, where when an object, and we wouldn't be able to actually physically see this in our everyday lives because objects just aren't moving that fast in our everyday lives to observe this, but theoretically speaking, if an object that is emitting light was coming toward you fast enough, at, at very, very high speeds, relativistic speeds, I'm talking 90 plus percent the speed of light, its light would be blue. You, you would see a blueness in its light. Its light would be what's called blue shifted. And it's the same effect. Since you are stationary and the subject is moving toward you, the light waves between that object that is moving toward you at a con at consistently and you, those light waves get squished. And a higher frequency light wave is blue. Now suppose the object started moving away from you. Well, in such an instant, the light waves are going to be stretched and they will appear red. And as I'm sure you're probably already thinking, this is called redshift. This is what's happening with the galaxies. They're moving away from us at such high speeds that the light that is emitted from all the stars and the gas and the dust, all the objects that are in that galaxy are emitting light, and the light that they're emitting is being stretched because of how fast that galaxy is moving away from us. But it's not just that they're emitting red light, it's that the redness, so to speak, is directly proportional to the distance. And this is something called Hubble's Law, or Generally in the modern age, let me draw that E a little better. Generally in the modern age, we refer to it as the... Oh, I need to make sure I spell his name right. I'm probably going to get it wrong, so I apologize. The hubble Lemaitre, Lemaitre, that's how it would be pronounced. The hubble Lemaitre Law. And George Lemaitre was the, the Jesuit priest, the, the Catholic, who um, developed the... The, the big, the hot big bang model. And so oftentimes, this is what you might see more frequently today is the Hubble Lemaitre law versus just the Hubble law, but they both work. And we actually have an equation for this handy law. And again, the law states that the, the redshift of a galaxy is directly proportional to its distance from us. And I believe it is, if I could get my pen and not my eraser, V equals h not d, where v is the, 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 I believe, the recessional velocity, h not here, and the, the, the o there is just a subscript, means h not is Hubble's law, and the d is the proper distance between us and that galaxy. This is the hubble lemaitre law. Pretty simple. You might be wondering, well, what exactly... It's this little guy. You said that's a constant. That should be equal to something. And it's equal to two different things. Either seventy three point four or It's equal to either 73.4 kilometers per second per megaparsec or 67.4 kilometers per second per megaparsec. That is how we represent the Hubble constant in, in, in kilometers per second per megaparsec. Because the speed is, again, the, the rate at which it's moving away from us. It's not just moving away from us at a rate. It's that that rate depends on how far away it already is. The further away it is, the faster it's moving away from us. So we would say it moves away from us at some speed, given in kilometers per second per megaparsec. And a megaparsec is, three is 326 light years, 3, 3.26 light years is a parsec, so a megaparsec would be, I believe, 326 million light years. I might have that wrong. I can't remember it right off the top of my head. These two values, the reason we have two values is because of how we can measure, I didn't actually want to erase that, how we can measure the Hubble constant. There are two ways that we can measure it. 
One way is by utilizing the cosmic microwave background radiation, the CMB, which is essentially uniform throughout all of space-time, at least as far as we've been capable of measuring. And when we, when we measure, when we utilize this in making measurements for how far away these galaxies are and how fast they're moving, we get 67.4 kilometers per second per megaparsec. We can also measure it utilizing what are called Cepheid variable stars, which are stars that, that pulsate in their, they, they pulsate and thus their luminosity increases, and they, they do this over well-defined periods, and so naturally one can infer that we can thereby use them to determine distances between us and something in space-time, or between other two objects in space-time. I believe that we can also do this with things called pulsars, which are pulsating neutron stars. And when we utilize objects like these to determine distances, we call those objects standard candles. And when we utilize standard candles, namely Cepheid variable stars, which is very, very accurate, we get... We get 73.4 kilometers per second per megaparsec. This is one of the largest conundrums in cosmology to date. We have no at these two values. We're both utilizing, <clears throat> excuse me, we're utilizing two very, very accurate, consistently accurate, demonstrably accurate methods for measuring distance, but we're getting two completely different results. This shouldn't be happening. It's either A, if, if this value here is wrong, then what this means is that st standard candles have been inaccurate since we've been using them to measure distance, which doesn't seem likely. But if this value is wrong, that means that we need some sort of new exotic physics to help us explain distances if we're utilizing the cosmic microwave background to determine them. These two, these two values should line up. Maybe not be exact, but they should be significantly closer than they are there. And they're not. And like I said, that is currently one of the largest problems. The, I mean, it depends on who you ask. Some would say it's the largest conundrum in cosmology. It's certainly one of them. But that is, it's one of those two values is what the Hubble constant is. The reason I wanted to introduce galactic redshift is because it's very important for understanding how we determine things like the age of the universe and what have you which are some things that I'm going to talk about. But I did want to introduce I did want to introduce galactic redshift before diving into those topics just so that people have have that in their mind and they have an understanding of what it is. In the next videos, we are like I said going to be covering some more topics in cosmology, the age of the universe, the big bang, beyond the big bang, a lot of really really juicy stuff. So, be sure to stick be sure to stick with us. We got some juicy stuff coming out. It's going to be fun. And with that, Remember, percossum nos perfectum, or through reason we progress.